Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight, sponsored today by Matillion. Today, William will be discussing the shifting landscape of data integration. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions by Twitter using hashtag ADVanalytics. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. To open the Q&A panel or the chat panel, you will find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn it over to Paul from Matillion for a brief word from our sponsor. Paul, hello and welcome. Hey, Shannon. Good to, good to be with you. And hello to everyone, uh, William, my co-presenter, and everyone that's on the call here today. I'm looking forward to, to having a really good conversation around the shifting landscape of, of data integration. And we'll kick it off here with a vendor perspective from Matillion. Uh, but first, a quick note about myself. Whoops. Uh, so my, my name is Paul Lacey. I'm a senior director of product marketing here at Matillion. I've been involved in the data integration world for quite some time now, holding various product marketing roles uh, in the business and in several uh, companies in the industry. Before that, I was a engineer through and through. I was a hardware engineer that transitioned into being more of a firmware and then full on software engineer. So a lot of experience um, kind of managing the technical aspects of data and really excited to get into that with you here today. Um, so in, in uh, thinking about what we could talk about with this subject, I, I thought the most interesting thing that we could share with you uh, from Matillion's perspective, and, and I'll tell you a little bit about Matillion a little bit later on, uh, but Matillion is a cloud ETL or cloud data integration provider. Um, and so we, we are born in the cloud and we work with all these uh, kind of modern cloud data platforms. So what we've noticed is some interesting shifts happening with, uh, with the discipline of data integration in the cloud. And, and that's what, what I'd like to share with you here today. Um, a lot of you might remember the three V's of big data, the volume, variety, and velocity of big data. Um, what we've noticed over the past couple of years is a shift as people transition to more cloud-based architectures um, that we've noticed there's a new set of challenges waiting for them in the cloud. And so that's what we're gonna dive into a little bit of research here um, that we've been doing into, into what that is and how we can address that with modern solutions. So uh, to start off, I have a little bit of research to share with you from our partners at IDC. Um, they have been doing a lot of uh, looking into this space and we've been working with them on this as well. This is a survey they ran late last year um, and was published early this year around some of the challenges that people experience when they, when they migrate their infrastructure to the cloud, as well as a number of the things that they find to be accelerators of their analytics in the cloud once they have dealt with the challenge. Um, and it's quite interesting, if you look down this list, you see a lot of things that you would expect, things like data security and quality, um, cloud migration, compliance. But at the top of the list, we see uh, data distribution is continuing to be a challenge as well as an accelerator once, once it's effectively dealt with in the cloud. Um, and so you know, what we've noticed is that there's a bit of a, a shift in some of the things that people might be used to dealing with in more of an on-prem environment when they shift to the cloud. In fact, IDC has come to the conclusion um, over the last couple of years that this is part of a much larger shift um, away from the traditional three Vs of big data that the cloud technologies and cloud scale technologies actually do a really good job of dealing with. You, they do a very good job of, of an enabling scale and elasticity to handle a lot of volume and velocity of data. And, and they certainly with a lot of the more modern approaches to, to data lakes and lake houses, et cetera, can deal with a variety of data quite well as, uh, as well. What we see when people migrate to the cloud is there's a new set of challenges waiting for them there. And that data is ever more diverse distributed and dynamic in the cloud. And so what do we, we mean by this? Well, when we think about the challenge of diversity uh, in the cloud, data is increasingly coming in new sources and formats. Um, it is coming from more and more SaaS APIs. Um, you know, we, we've seen just an explosion of SaaS in the enterprise over the past five to 10 years. Um, and that's really starting to play a role in how people think about architecting their their cloud infrastructure and their integration paradigms. You know, things like uh, data fabrics have become more popular. Things like data meshes have become more popular, primarily to deal with the fact that it's e easier than ever now to pull out a credit card and, and spin up a data silo. 
um, in, in the cloud. And, and with that also comes the challenge of being having to process lots of different types of data and different JSON formats and schemas, um, as well as a lot of other types of formats as people have realized that they now have the ability to do so. They're being put pressure on them and, and their data teams to process um, all types of data. And, and, um, and IDC breaks it down in terms of a lot of broad strokes here, but um, transactional data, geospatial data, multimedia data, all these different data types, um, they find that more than 50% of organizations are processing at least four different types, distinct types of data in those broad categories in their analytics today. The second thing, as I mentioned before, related to diversity is the distribute, distributed nature of data in the cloud. And data is being stored in more and more um, operational systems that are at the edge. Um, you know, IoT is becoming more of a factor when it comes to centralizing data or thinking about how you wanna process your data. Um, and so they, they need to find new ways of dealing with the distribution challenge in the cloud. And finally, data is more dynamic in the cloud with more systems that are owning the data um, and more APIs and, and, and whatnot to, to integrate with, um, teams are having less and less control over things like schema drift um, and, and other things that, that can happen in the cloud that in, with infrastructure that's not under their control. And that requires them to be dynamic as well. They need to be agile and iterative when it comes to thinking about how they roll out their infrastructure and how they, um, they, they make incremental improvements to it as well. Um, you know, so we see the rise of concepts like data ops as being a kind of offshoot of, of the need for people to move faster and, and deliver results faster in the cloud as well. So a little bit about Matillion. Um, you know, we, kind of, we think about Matillion as a modern solution to modern challenges. As I mentioned, we are a cloud data, uh, cloud data integration provider. Um, really our secret sauce is the ability to, to give uh, data teams low code environments with absolutely no compromise. And, for, for some that might have worked with uh, more legacy kind of ETL providers, you know, usually there's a bit of a trade-off to be had between whether or not you can do things easily and quickly in the tool, uh, but you are kind of forced into some rigid paradigms um, or whether or not you can actually uh, provide a lot of customization, but then you have to basically you know, reinvent the wheel from scratch quite frequently. What we think we've done, what we have done at Matillion is really strike a good balance there so that the way we've architected our tool using best in class cloud frameworks and push down transformation technologies, we can enable teams to have really rich granular levels of control when they need it. Um, but they have the simplicity of drag and drop and kind of low code development when they don't, uh, when, when their goal is to move quickly and kind of reuse things. And so towards that end, we think about four key principles to every product that we design and develop. Um, we think about products these days need to be easy to use. Um, like we talked about with the, uh, um, the, the dynamicism of data, product uh, data teams need to move much, much quicker now than they ever did before. And in order to do that, these, these tools need to be intuitive. Uh, they need to be um, you know, low management, low overhead. They need to be fast uh, to pick up and they need to be uh, easy for easily interchangeable so that people can, can come into the team and understand what's going on very quickly. Um, all of those things are kind of behind the, the, the design philosophy um, of what we do. We are built for the cloud. And what that means is we leverage the full power of the cloud with push down translations on all of the native platforms that we support. You can see all of them over here on the left. Um, all these modern cloud data platforms are continuously coming up with new features and capabilities, new built in AI and ML capabilities um, you know, that are native to their platforms. Matillion is so tightly integrated that we surface all of those uh, feature functionalities in our low code tool uh, and, and allow people to take advantage of that without needing to fall back on Python scripts or, or things that um, would be required in more legacy environments. So um, very, very powerful. We win awards all the time for how tightly integrated we are with our partners. Um, and we really focus on bringing the power of the cloud to you. We are built for the enterprise um, and really through and through from the ground up, we, we take things like enterprise security um, very seriously. Uh, we, we've de designed our, our um, process and our products to be seamlessly scalable across large volumes of data. In fact, one of the key innovations that we've unlocked here at Matillion is the ability to separate logic from compute in much the same way that the modern cloud data platforms say they have separated compute from storage, uh, which, which is a tremendous innovation on their end, which allows them to own best in class compute. 
we leverage their best in class compute by separating the logic layer from the compute layer. So we can run the same logic on wildly um, different volumes of data and different infrastructures as well um, with relatively low overhead and, and uh, portability. So, um, so again, we, we are built through and through for the enterprise. And finally, we focus on allowing our teams to deliver transformative value. We do that in a number of different ways. We do it in the way that we allow people to rapidly deliver re, um, insights and, and uh, results back into their business. Um, but we also do that in the way that we allow them to pay for and use the software. And we've just recently rolled out a industry leading credit-based consumption model where um, we have this concept of universal credits um, on Matillion. And, and so there's no subscriptions to be had and there's no contracts to be signed for new functionality. You simply pay for credits. Uh, you consume them when you use parts of our platform. As we continue to roll out new parts of our platform, those can be consumed using the same credits that you've paid for in, in, in the past. And so you can essentially just use it when you need it and not use it when you don't need it. It's very flexible, allows for very tight ROI between um, data initiatives and, uh, and the, the spin that you have for infrastructure underneath. We have a couple of core products that help us do this. We have our Matillion ETL flagship uh, uh, data integration suite, as well as our lightweight and free Matillion data loader um, SaaS data collector, which collects data from a number of SaaS sources and allows you to seamlessly with a no code wizard, load that into some of the leading cloud data platforms today. Um, both of these are available um, for use today. As I mentioned, uh, Matillion Data Loader is available for free for use at matillion.com. Uh, and uh, Matillion ETL is our flagship product with much more uh, functionality like we just discussed. If any of this has piqued your interest, um, we would be happy to have some more conversations with you about this. Uh, you can visit us on the web at matillion.com and get in touch with someone who can answer all your questions and kind of show you Matillion in action. And we welcome the opportunity to do so. Uh, but with that, I will thank you for your attention and I will turn it back over to Shannon. Paul, thank you so much for kicking us off and thanks to Matillion for sponsoring and help making these webinars happen. If you have a question for Paul, feel free to submit the questions in the Q&A section of, the, of your screen uh, as he will be joining us in the Q&A at the end of the webinar today. Now let me introduce to you our series a uh, speaker for the series, William McKnight. William has advised many of the world's best known organizations, his strategies from the information management plan for leading companies in numerous industries. He is a prolific author and popular keynote speaker and trainer. He has performed dozens of benchmarks on leading database, data lake, streaming, and data integration products. And with that, I will give the floor to William to get his section of the presentation started. Hello and welcome. Hello, thank you, Shannon. And thank you, Paul. It's great to have Matillion aboard Advanced Analytics here. They are quite a compelling data integration uh, vendor. And that's not easy to do these days, as you'll see as we go through some of the requirements that you guys have for data integration, that it's a pretty high bar. Anyway, uh, before we get started, um, I asked my friend John, who attends all of these, hello if you're out there, John, um, how these were going for him as an attendee. And he said, great, great information, well organized and all these accolades and I appreciated it. But he said, you gotta let your hair down a little bit more because we spend an hour with you every month here and we don't know that much about you and, and uh, let your hair down a little bit. So I'll let my hair down a little bit here and let you know the thing I will let you know is I'm a dog owner. Um, we, we here at the McKnight house are uh, two-time foster failures. So we've accumulated these four dogs in the house. I guess we specialize in the 12 pound and below because that's kind of where they are, uh, but they, they keep us on our toes. I'm also heavily into fitness and I am the current national age group champion of these things called DecaFit and High Rocks Pro. If they mean nothing to you, then you're probably normal. <laughs> but uh, if uh, they mean anything to you and you want to reach out on, on behalf of uh, any of that, uh, I'd be more than happy to do that. I enjoy talking about all the, all the racing that I do and the training for it. So a lot of fun there. And I also play a little piano, although I must admit it's been hard to get the time to do it lately. Uh, I play mostly classical, but um, we'll play just about anything. If I get the time for it. <laughs> it's hard when your data environments out there look like this. Data processes, people, privacy problems and projects. Over time, 
it begins to look like a spaghetti mess. And that's just normal. Uh, I, I don't wanna say, I don't wanna excuse all the messes out there, of course. Um, if you've been following this series, you know I like to get things as organized as possible, yet keep the business moving forward. And I know that that is hard and I've given you lots of tips over the years uh, as to how, to how to do this very thing. But we have today, we have code all over the place. We have data all over the place. We have various profiles of usage of this data. And sometimes, well, quite frequently, actually, they have demands as to how they want to consume the data. And now we throw in, we definitely have to throw in compliance and audit uh, these days because those requirements are looming large uh, within us. And oh, by the way, things change quite a bit. And so we're trying to support, if you will, I don't care if you're in you know, a business area or central IT, wherever you sit, if you're working this technology area, this architecture area, we're trying to support applications. And to do that, every application is gonna be a little bit different. Some of them are gonna be more keen to share. Some of them are gonna be less keen to share. I want you to have, as the data expert, and I do speak to the data experts within enterprise companies out there in this series. I know we get a ton of vendors and consultants and welcome, of course, but I do kind of speak to the persona of the person in the enterprise trying to make sense of all this out there in their enterprise and do governance over the top of it. So we have a lot of data integration going on is kind of my point. We have more data integration going on than ever. So yeah, just because we're not just doing data warehousing anymore doesn't mean that we're, the data integration has gone away. Actually, with the more decentralized approach, you could argue that there's a whole lot more data integration going on. And there's a lot of valid platforms. And that's what I want to talk about is why do we have so many data stores? Now, I talk to clients all the time about this. And a lot of them, a lot of you are fretting about why you have so many data stores. Some of you are reasonably fretting because you're, 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 you have 100 and it's, it's, it's out of control and nothing gets reused at that point. There's kind of a, a bubble, if you will, a graph. If, if you can graph this in your mind, there's kind of a, a bubble in the middle where you have just the right amount and, and variety of data stores in your environment. But when you get beyond that, it actually becomes far less efficient because you begin to be overwhelmed and now you have a high management uh, need around what you have. There is such a thing as too few data stores. I haven't found that client yet that has too few. Uh, a lot uh, will try to have a few, which is I think a, a, a worthy goal. And we want to try to reuse. And I think the real key word here to get this right is, is reuse. Right? We want to build things for reuse. I call it leverage, uh, data warehousing, data lakes, uh, operational data lakes, master data management environments. This is where I train my CDO clients to focus on, focus on leverage, focus on the biggest bang for the buck and creating structure that actually can be leveraged throughout multiple applications over the course of time and is future proofed. So many of you have an enterprise agreement with you know, one of the big vendors, right? And you kind of reach for that software, that database, if you will, for most of your needs. And for a lot of the needs, that's gonna be just fine because it doesn't matter too much. But I have found in the past five years that the majority, over 50% of the applications that we work on that I'm exposed to out there has some unique requirements that you cannot just do that thing I just mentioned and feel like you're going to succeed. So what I'm seeing now is we are going through a process here. We're kind of in the middle probably of a good five years, six years, seven years of companies deciding that they need to break away from that primary vendor and do some other things and consider some best of breed out there because they have unique requirements. It's not that our requirements are, are supersizing or outsizing the, the abilities of technology, it's not really that at all. It's about right fitting technology to meet the demand of the application in the enterprise. And that means you're gonna have, you're gonna have different data storage, and you're gonna have data integration as a result. Performance is one thing. So you're kind of, if I may say the word generic, your, your everyday kind of database may not have the performance characteristics that you need 
for a given application. I know that this is true for, again, the majority of the applications that we've been working on and exposed to over the past five years. And, And people want performance out of the box. Gone are the days when it's okay to tinker, tinker, tinker forever with the database to dial in that performance. The demands are really day one. Day one, the performance at level that is needed. And of course, you know, we can go from there, but uh, out of the box performance is very important. And that's usually what we measure in our benchmarks is out of the box performance, because that's what we hear people want. What else? What else? Cost predictability and transparency. So it used to be that we used to spend this big cycle trying to spec the platform and we usually got it wrong. <laughs> I'll say I usually got it wrong. Um, too little, too much, what have you. Um, and of course with elast- Elastic uh, platforms, which we're almost all on now, at least for new stuff, um, that kind of goes out the window, that need. But the need to manage costs does not go out the window at all. As a matter of fact, it's now an ongoing concern within the enterprise. And you have to have much more dedicated skills and knowledge around cost and keep a closer eye on it because you're getting a bill every month. Whereas before you could do it, it would go away and maybe you revisit that in six months when you're looking at, oh my gosh, we're paying for all this capacity that we're not using, or maybe the reverse is true. We need more capacity. So that generates an event. Well, cost predictability and transparency is less of an event anymore it's really an ongoing concern. It's something that somebody in the data team needs to be tasked with keeping an eye on. That means they need to put a notice on their calendar, what have you, whatever it takes to check in on the ongoing costs and making sure that it's in alignment. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, frustration out there with uh, cost predictability and transparency, even of these clouds, especially of these cloud databases, because it kind of hits you in the face when you need more resources than you thought, and things just sort of add up. Anyway, administration. I find that companies with an excess of of staff that's qualified in the data area has less of a concern about this, but eventually it even can become a concern there when efficiency is, is, you know, becomes front and center. And in those shops, which are most, I would say, that are shorter staffed on you know, great administration around these data products, administration, ease of administration certainly becomes a thing. So this is, this is a, a, a criteria by which some people out there have decided they need to go with a different database. Now it's usually multi-factored, but this is one of the leading factors alongside performance as to why sometimes you change platforms and you fork off you fork off of that data warehouse and you don't necessarily go with the same database when you fork that off and you go with a mart, you build a lake, you build a specialized structure and so on. You may need some of the things that special optimizers do. Not all optimizers do conditional parallelism. Not all optimizers do dynamic and controllable prioritization of resources, et cetera. Now, workload isolation, do you need this stuff? Well, you only know that when you know your workload. And when you go into these things heads up and you know your workload, you can decide if you need an optimizer that, that does these things. Because some optimizers have not been worked on very much uh, in the past five to 10 years. And uh, really an opportunity missed there because uh, the optimizers needed more than ever now that we're demanding much faster turnaround of great performance and so on. We need, to, we need the ability to Uh, introduce a few less than optimal things in our design and in our queries and so on, and let it be okay. Uh, Well, that falls, then the work falls back on the optimizer. Concurrency, I'll say concurrency scaling because most of the databases are pretty good down at the one to five concurrent level and they'll scale linearly to that point. But then we see a vast uh, divergence of concurrency at that point. Uh, we've tested up to 50 concurrent users, uh, which some, shop, some shops will have. And of course you can play design games to get around that. But again, we're looking at out of the box. We're trying to look at these platforms from the perspective of if I land this platform tomorrow, you know, what is the environment gonna look like the next day? Because that's what my clients care about. 
And so we're looking at concurrency scaling to 50, 100, whatever the case may be. And you may not have that need in whatever application you're working on. Okay, great. But I will add that again, over 50% of my uh, workload and the workload I'm exposed to in the past five years has had exceedingly greater concurrency requirements than the previous ones. So uh, also a thing to look at when you look at concurrency scaling is the cost. And the cost of concurrency scaling might get you. So keep an eye on that. Resource elasticity. I know we, we, we throw this word around, um, but if you really don't know what the workload is going to be, or if it's going to vary quite a bit, or if it's going to grow steadily, whatever the case may be, you don't want to be paying for the gap that is there just in case. Some of my clients in the past, have, I've given them the, the estimate, they've doubled it just in case. Well, that's expensive. And that's an expense that we don't really need to have anymore when you have great resource elasticity. And although all the vendors will say they have it, um, this refers to hands off elasticity, not, oh, we got to call the vendor, we have to do a budget negotiation, uh, it's going to take a week, we have to schedule it in, blah, blah, blah. And it's going to be huge, you know, 10 terabytes at a time or something like that. That's kind of ridiculous uh, today. So that's one thing to look out for. And many workloads need that, which is another reason why we have so many platforms in the enterprise today. Oh, this is a big one, machine learning. We are considering machine learning now in everything that we do, in everything that we are specking from an application perspective. I mean, unless it's super low complexity. Uh, machine learning is replacing BI in some cases. Machine learning is taking the place of BI uh, in many cases that when we're, where we're designing an application where we wouldn't even think about it before. Before we'd be introducing data analysts and, and time and specialized structure for the analysts and so on. Now we're thinking more about, can I get the data into the algorithms? How do I get the data into the algorithms the best? And for that, we need machine learning. And there's way different ways to skin this cat right now. I think it'll settle. I think machine learning is coming into the database and some uh, databases, for example, I think Vertica is touting some 400 odd uh, capabilities in machine learning. And uh, so, I mean, we're seeing a lot more of that. We're seeing a lot more built in uh, access machine learning, kind of like how we used to access any SQL statement and letting it, letting it go, get trained on the data, do its thing. And we want machine learning like everything else to be sort of hands off and work. And so looking at the machine learning characteristics of platforms is causing some to diverge. Yes, and data storage format alternatives. There are many out there now, and sometimes it's that we're getting data in, in ORC, Pat Parquet, JSON, Avro, et cetera, we're getting data in that way. And well, it just sort of makes sense to store it that way. Well, not all data platforms are great about that. So you might diverge. And sometimes we actually want to store whatever data we're getting in these formats for all the benefits that it provides. And sometimes we turn to the NoSQL marketplace, which are obviously specialists in this type of data structure, but frequently uh, the capabilities are growing within you know, the database marketplace. And so we're looking at those capabilities as well. So there's big decisions to be made for you when it comes to when you have uh, data storage format alternatives to you know, good old alphanumeric data when it comes to platforms. So hopefully you're you're uh, taking account of that. Uh, again, platforming is important. It is important to the success of the project. Today's environment is complex. We need context, we need lineage. We need to know where that data is coming from. We need to know where it's been, who's done what to it and different things like this. And we have to consider the cost of the environment. Yeah, we're not none of us are gonna get it perfect but if we can get kind of in that great zone, uh, then we'll be far better off. Um, and today we have BI tools, SaaS tools and applications, machine learning applications that want data from multiple of these platforms. Usually we're not, the, we're not perfect about 
putting all the data into one platform for a given complex application. So there, therefore we sometimes introduce data virtualization. Sometimes we actually add more data to these leverageable stores so that they can support the application. Yeah, different ways to go about it. So when it comes to data integration, now we see that we need it. Now we see that it's normal. Now we see some of the reasons why we get into the situations we get into and why some of the many platforms out there are very relevant. So if you have 10, if you have 20, whatever, uh, you might just be where you need to be, not to worry, but you do need to put it all together through data virtualization, as I mentioned, and good old data integration. Although it shouldn't say good old because it's changing. That's sort of the, the emphasis today. We have new goals now with the data integration product that we use on a given application. Now, I don't believe for a minute that any enterprise that's mid-size or up is, is optimal with one data integration product. I believe you might need an anchor kind of product that's sort of the default that, you, that you're good at. But most of my better clients in the data area, I'll say, have this sort of data and enterprise data integration product, but they also have other products, maybe from the same vendor, maybe not, that actually do things at a more, with a more ease of use feel to them. Something that works great for a business user or a department, as opposed to something that feels more central IT oriented. And, you know, to be fair, a lot of the enterprise data integration players are improving their UI to make it more user-friendly because they know this trend is very true as well. So we want the product, whatever it is, to be cloud native today. I cannot imagine that that is not a huge requirement for data integration in any modern application. We want intelligently driven automation and we want it to do a lot of different things with, within, I won't go into it right now, but within a data integration product, there's a lot that can be done intelligently. So here I say generate new pipelines, uh, source and target without manually mapping or design. Yeah, without doing that tedious manual mapping step that frankly I haven't figured out how to do any better than pulling out a good old spreadsheet <laughs> and, and listing out the columns and typing in the, the uh, transformation rules that I want and so on, building a spec that way. Um, data orchestration, yeah, this has got to be part of data integration. Managing the ebb and flow of data throughout the ecosystem, you want to see everything that's going on, determining what data is analyzed, determining what data is moved upstream, and at what granularity and state, moving, integrating, and updating data, metadata, and master data and machine learning models as evolution happens at the core. So that whole feel of data orchestration is important to have within your data integration product. Trust created through transparency and understanding. So definitely security on top of this. Uh, and a lot of the trust also will come from, not from the tool, but from your programs, from your processes that go around it. And are you communicating how that data evolves and how it gets to the point where the user actually grabs it or the application actually grabs it and wants to use it? Are you communicating? how that data got there and is it right? Is it right for use? Uh, so there's a lot of, you know, there's still left a lot for uh, human understanding in this process to make data integration successful. Able to dynamically and even automatically scale to meet the increasing, increasing complexity and concurrency demands of query executions because they continue. Okay, so let's look in more detail at some of the capabilities for cloud. Uh, data integration, right? Data lineage is one of them. And I won't belabor this too much, but I have to say this is a new one. This has been really added to our vernacular when we do, when we go to market for clients, when we look at the market uh, for tools and it's, it's severely lacking. It's severely behind the requirements that organizations have. So they're home, home rolling, if you will, you know, some of the data lineage requirements, which is tedious at best, or they're doing something else. And there's a tool out there called Manta, for example, we like it for data lineage. If that's a huge requirement, you might want to augment what, whatever you're doing with data integration with something like that, because that will track, uh, do all this stuff at a very detailed level. 
which I'm, I'm saying is increasingly uh, important because we have legislation, legislative bodies and compliance requirements. We have data discovery initiatives. These are all use cases for data lineage. And sometimes use cases are multiple of these. So anyway, data lineage requirements. Yeah, we need the tool to represent things graphically. We need to, we need to see impact analysis these days. In data integration, you need to have impact analysis. Sometimes what's in the data integration tool is good for that, but sometimes it's not. So we want to look at if I change this column, if I change this feed, what gets affected? We don't, we, you know, in an enterprise, we can't just do it and, and wait for the fallout, right? <laughs> that used to be something that was on the table, but uh, I think uh, these data systems are pretty critical these days and we can't just do that. So we have to know. And, and usually when we don't have that capability, that means we're piling on, we're adding on to what we got because we don't wanna to touch what we got. We're duplicating work effort and so on. And we're adding every day to the inefficiency of the environment, which one day that comes back to bite you. And so we, we love that clean environment. Root cause analysis is a big part of that. We want data lineage to extend to non-standard or custom sources, not just your everyday Salesforce and ERP systems and so on, but really everything and general accessibility to that lineage and metadata requirements. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about that data lineage requirement, which is kind of new. And here's uh, the data integration requirements that we are working with right now. Uh, if you want a fuller treatment of these requirements, check back on my April advanced analytics uh, webinar here, uh, which I don't know if it's on YouTube or not, but um, should be on dataversity.net. Uh, check it out and I go through each of these in great detail. So I won't do that today, but I will go through them. Make sure you understand that these are some of the things you're looking for in data integration for a given application. Now, every application is gonna have a different profile. That's why I love it when we actually profile the data integration requirements for an application and take that sensible document to, to market uh, and don't just reach for the same old, same old. Now, you do this, it might end up that your enterprise DI vendor is great and that's great or close enough and that's great too, but you might find that you need something else. Comprehensive, native connectivity multi-latency data ingestion. You need to be able to take that data in, in different patterns. Data integration patterns, ETL, ELT, batch, streaming, data quality and data governance over the top. Oh yeah, that's really important. And I'm, and I'm seeing more that we, we, we are loving to abstract our rules in a tool that's focused on that, like a data catalog. So that's the next one, data cataloging and metadata management. And letting that rule just take place throughout all new development within the enterprise. That's kind of the holy, the short-term holy grail, if you will, that I'm looking at in vendor solutions. I don't think we're quite there yet. The integration with premier data catalogs like Alation and Calibra are, shall we say, a work in progress. Uh, but when that happens more, and when, the, frankly, the data catalogs come up in the enterprise you know, data integration vendors, we're gonna see more abilities uh, around this, in this area. And we're seeing this is one of many things that should be pushing down our cycles in data integration over time. Data, our data integration cycles don't need to be scaling linearly with the volume of data that we're managing or the volume of platforms that we're managing. I think that data integration, the tools, it's time for the tools to step in and Put a, put a ceiling, I guess, on that. Let us do some other things. Enterprise trust, artificial intelligence and automation. To me, this is uh, nascent uh, coming on board uh, in these tools, nascent, I should say, um, and something that will help you know that you're getting into a future-proofed tool, a tool that is um, going to be uh, absorbing artificial intelligence means it's going to be more efficient over time. It's really almost too late for a tool to be stepping up to artificial intelligence today. It's, it's high time. So something to look at in your, in your tool of choice. And the whole ecosystem, and, and we're kind of all multi-cloud these days, so that's great when that is true. 
there are some really good tools within a given environment, like AWS and Azure, for example, or in Google. And but you're committing. You're committing full that full application to that platform because those tools don't work outside of that their platform. So make your choice wisely there. Uh, make sure you're future proofing what you do. And a lot of times that means the tool that works in multiple clouds. Yeah. We also have these data prep requirements. And I don't necessarily mean it's a data prep tool, if you will, but we have requirements at a lower scale of that need that I was just talking about. And this might be because it's smaller scale of in terms of data, in terms of users, in terms of complexity, et cetera, in terms of fluff time that you have to get the thing up and running, okay? So there are tools that are designed more as a low setup, no config and no maintenance data pipeline to lift data from operational sources and deliver it wherever. My example is a modern cloud data warehouse. Well suited for popular cloud applications. We should not be reinventing the wheel if we're pulling data out of Salesforce, Stripe, Marketo, et cetera, uh, of these, of these type, type of uh, popular cloud applications. And very few of you are doing that. We used to do that. I, I used to do this for SAP. <laughs> and uh, it be, even before they had their, their, uh, their BW, if you will. And um, so we'd be pulling the data out. Of course, the uh, column names were in German and it was very difficult and tedious. Well, hopefully nobody does that anymore. That's an extreme example, <laughs> but people still uh, probably do that a little bit. Transformations are SQL based rules written by business users and set to run on a schedule. So there needs to be some transformations even at data prep level. They may not be as elegant or as profound as you know what an enterprise tool might need, but this is a different price point. This is a different scale. But what is what has happened is this is all, I say all this, right? I say all this about data prep, but it's gotten kind of blurry lately because you have tools like Matillion that's stepping up raising its hand for more enterprise needs, um, bringing that ease of use that I said before is required up to the enterprise. Um, you may sacrifice a little bit of that deeper level of control uh, today. You may or may not need it, but uh, bringing ease of use to the enterprise is uh, pretty important. So again, you're stepping into this marketplace. It's not for the faint of heart. Uh, it's for someone that really knows it and uh, can get, can get into the right, can get you into the right tool uh, that is future-proof that will do the job for now and forever. And even as platforms change, maybe you're working in a data mart today and eventually this does need to be part of the data warehouse just for efficiency's sake. So there again, uh, you have a need. Now, uh, application programming interfaces. So I've been talking about data integration tools and they're great and all that. And sometimes we need something that's gonna bring that data to the table a little bit better than what we can do otherwise. And today, increasingly, that's an application programming interface with or without a data integration tool. These are becoming numerous. These are becoming de facto standards of communication within and, with and beyond uh, the enterprise. So they've begun to replace older, more cumbersome methods of information sharing with lightweight endpoints due to the popularity and proliferation of microservices. In particular, the need has arisen to manage the multitude of services a company relies on and organizations depend on these services. Now, we at McKnight have a working definition that has held true for us for a couple of years. We've done several benchmarks in the API arena. And that is 10,000, or excuse me, 1,000 transactions per second. 1,000 transactions per second on their API endpoints. I don't know, does that sound like a lot? It's, uh, it's higher end, I would say, but it's certainly something within the realm of need in the next year or two for many of the applications that we're working on, probably that you're working on. So how are the APIs doing at that level? You know, there are companies out there, I'll just mention a few, Kong, Ingenix, API 7. There are companies out there that provide a host of uh, different APIs. And I think enterprises now need one of those vendors uh, aboard so that they have access to all the capabilities that these tools have built into their architecture. So go choosing uh, one of those as well. I've given you several things to 
to get here, several things uh, today that you can buy and not build. Um, always a good thing uh, over the course of time. API microservices ecosystem, there's public APIs and we enjoy working with these, right? There's over 20,000, there's stuff like weather, there's stuff like stocks, stuff like currency, stuff like um, news, uh, things like that. And you can look at programmableweb.com. Most programmers are familiar with that and look at all the APIs out there. And I don't know what number we're at now, but 20,000 uh, not too long ago. So it probably 25,000 by now, but anyway, you might have private APIs with external partners or with internal partners. And the platform architecture, you've got clients, you might have a load balancer. We've used Ingenix a lot. Uh, then you have different API nodes that you set up. I'm showing the Kong logo there, but uh, you know, there's different ones and they have their database and they distribute the data to the endpoints. So anyway, this is a great thing to take a lot of cycles, not only cycles, but performance take cycles off and add performance to the whole idea of data integration with or without a data integration tool. So these endpoints could be data integration tools that take the data into deeper transformation, load it with much more manageability into a uh, data warehouse and so on. You want to bring a lot more rigor, a lot more standards to how you load the data into these leverageable platforms. That's not for, well, let's just, let's load it this way and and uh, hope for the best and we know it'll work day one kind of thing. This is, you know, we, we want to put high levels of, well, standard uh, onto our data warehouses, data lakes and so on, because those are going to get highly used. And then you also have critical applications that the same is true for. And sometimes you can, sometimes you can uh, sort of uh, take it as it goes, if you will, but uh, frequently we can't. So requirements around APIs, good for high performance workloads like streaming solutions, which I'm gonna to get to in a minute here. Uh, reliability, all workloads completed with 100% message completion, no failures. So test, test your APIs, uh, grab one of our benchmarks to see how you can test those APIs and see that you get 100% message completion. See how it does at the different 99.9 .9 plus percentiles, if you will. And, and by the way, uh, be sure you turn on the plugins that you're going to have turned on in the process of executing the API and see what kind of overhead that puts on the whole process. Now, I've talked about data integration tools and APIs, and there's also streaming solutions to kind of round it out. When might you need uh, something else? Well, I'm going to get back to this frequent thing I keep saying, which is that the workloads are changing out there. And the, what we're seeing in terms of requirements for modern workloads is at a different level, different scale than what it used to be. And that means the volume of data coming in uh, falls into what we call the streaming category. And ETL can be quite insufficient when you know you're dealing with streaming data. And, and when I say ETL, I mean ELT as well. It, you, you just need something that's going to handle things better. now. There are brokers that you can put into the middle of all this. Uh, I call them uh, traffic cops or post offices, if you will, uh, that really help out a lot here and feed the data out and feed it in a sensible context. And that's stuff like uh, you know, Kafka, which we'll get to here. But first of all, ETL. ETL forces you either to have real-time loading without being scalable or scalability with batch loading, but not real-time loading. And that's kind of where a lot of those tools are at today. This isn't a hard and fast statement. This isn't a quantified statement, but this should trigger you to actually make sure that you're not forcing yourself into something that is not future-proofed with ETL when you have real-time data, also known as messaging live feeds, real-time or event-driven, where the data comes in continuously and often quickly. So we call it streaming data, it needs special attention. And this data, is not only needed for whatever application you're doing, supply chain, fraud detection, uh, customer churn analysis, these things come to mind, but just as a general foundation for anything that you're doing with artificial intelligence, which wants all your data. It wants, it wants all data down at a granular level. So this is it. Doesn't get much more granular than this, real-time data. 
and stream data forms the core of data for artificial intelligence, truth be told. So the, uh, the, the base data, if you will, uh, of, of alphanumeric, financially oriented, et cetera, kind of data. Yeah, that's master data, if you will. That's important for artificial intelligence to provide context to the transactions, but the real transactions are found within streaming data. So enter message-oriented middleware, also known as streaming and message queuing technology. So this is all about the messages and I'm gonna go a little fast here. That's okay, I think. Um, things you're gonna look for in the solution, throughput, storage, how's the data stored? What kind of latency are you gonna fall behind? Falling behind is sort of the death knell for streaming when you're loading that data, unless you have a, a gap coming up, which usually we don't, which is why it's streaming data and also how the thing operates. These are things you're gonna look at. So the streaming platform will go into the middle of all of the apps and all of the uh, downstream uh, nodes on the, on the pipeline. And this will be something like a Kafka, which uh, is very popular these days, open source streaming platform developed at LinkedIn. Not everybody knows that. Uh, kind of an interesting nugget, I would say. Uh, it's, it's a distributed pub sub messaging system that maintains feeds of messages called topics. So if you're in that world, you know about topics, you know about assigning records to topics, and then the subscribers, the syncs, if you will, can subscribe to topics and just pull off that kind of data. Just be careful doing all this, that you're still doing you know, something architected. You're not using Kafka, et cetera, as an excuse to, to have an unarchitected environment and to spread all data everywhere. Okay, I've seen that, and that's, uh, that's a little annoying. Pulsar, something we're very keen on, you can find our benchmarks on this. This was originally developed at Yahoo, began its incubation at Apache in late 2016. It's been in production as at Yahoo for three years prior in many things. I don't know if you feel like Yahoo things are uh, credible or not, but anyway, they did quite a bit at Yahoo before their demise. Uh, follows the pub sub model and has the same producers topics and consumers as Kafka. Uh, but uh, as we have shown, it operates with good performance. So when you look at your workloads, they're distinguished by the number of topics, the size of the messages, et cetera. What you see here, these are the things that you wanna look at when determining the right streaming solution for you, or even if it's a, a streaming solution. If you can't look at the workload and, and see topics and see messages and see subscribers and producers, then maybe you're back in the, uh, back in the data integration world. Not, nothing wrong with that, but make sure you're not in this world uh, with, um, and, and you put the wrong tool on it, right? Okay, so key takeaways before I get to your questions. Um, by the way, if you have questions, go ahead and lob them into the Q&A panel and Paul and I will do our best with them in just a minute. But this is my summary slide. An enterprise has many different types of data stores as well as many data stores of the same type. Uh, we try to limit that, but there are reasons. There are reasons. And this, is, this extends to clouds as well. So now we have multiple clouds with multiple stores. And so it's not just our enterprise that we have to be concerned about anymore, our physical enterprise that is. The reasons for this are many, and I went through them. It is fully expected that enterprise environments would have a heterogeneous vendor. That's that enterprise vendor I spoke of, as well as other vendors for data integration, right? APIs have begun to replace older, more cumbersome methods of information sharing. Talked about APIs. Uh, definitely avail yourself of that marketplace if applicable. And then streaming and message queuing. Going to be around for a while, able to meet real-time data volume variety and timing requirements of the coming year. So another future-proofed item for you to consider as you are doing all that data integration in your enterprise to try to keep all that data in some sensible architecture. And that has been my presentation part. And I will turn it back over to Shannon to see if we have any questions. William, thank you so much for another great presentation. If you have questions for William or for Paul, uh, feel free to submit them in the Q&A panel, and, which you can find in the bottom middle of your screen there. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. Uh, just everyone's quiet right now. I know y'all got questions. 
<laughs> we'll give everyone a minute here to uh, log to type in their questions. So, uh, Paul, anything, any observance from the uh, Williams presentation? Anything you want to add in or chime in on there? Yeah, definitely. Uh, great presentation, William. Thank you for taking through taking us through all this, and I can tell that you have a tremendous amount of insight. Um, you have the the really unique uh, perspective of being able to sit across a number of different clients and kind of pull out best practices, and I always love hearing those. Um, you know, one of the things that we, we, we you talked a little bit about message cues, right, for for data, um, and we do see a lot of people that are starting to do that, where they're publishing uh, sort of micro events onto message queues and they're expecting the data integration platforms to be able to pick those up and, and do something with them, which you know is, is a use case that we support at Matillion as well. But another, I think, more interesting use case that we see, and I'd be curious, William, if you see this as well, you mentioned that people are starting to have more and more components of their data infrastructure, data integration architecture than before. What we see happening is uh, people wanting to write out to message queues, not with data, but with events that drive other orchestration around their platform. So, mm -hmm. you know, you'll see people wanting to publish to Amazon SNS, for example, um, or Google PubSub uh, when a job is completed for an integration task or a transformation task. And then that alerts, uh, you know, other downstream systems to, to take action based on the fact that the data set is prepared for analysis. I'm curious, William, do you see that happening in your architectures as well? I think that's that's clearly something that's that's going to happen and it's something that it's something that leading edge organizations are considering today and, and doing. Um, because just moving data usually doesn't actually do the thing that the enterprise actually wants done. So it's picking up the intelligence out of the data and doing the right thing, even automatically. And so, yes, we have applications that are doing that. Um, yes, uh, vendors are, are talking about it. Um, and I think it definitely is a way of the future. All this automation, all this efficiency, anything to do with AI, uh, anything that AI can do, which is a lot, I think is a wave of the future and uh, something that leading organizations definitely should be thinking about now. So yes, we're seeing, we're seeing that for sure. I love it. And uh, we do have some questions coming in now. You know, do you have any rules of thumb for choosing the right integration paradigm or product type? You gave a few examples as we walk through this, but um, do you have a quick summary? Um, I don't know that I, I have a quick summary. Grab the slides because I think um, it's, it might be kind of embedded throughout um, when I talk about, you know, requirements for DI tools, which I guess I, guess I would say that your DI tool, as we've come to call them, um, is sort of the default. So when do you need to break away? Well, if there are APIs, uh, you definitely want to consider that. If it is streaming data, and if you recognize yourself in that arena, if it's that volume of data, then um, consider what uh, Pulsar or a Kafka can do and add to that architecture mix. And uh, are you aware of any um data lineage automation um, that truly works? <laughs> um, yes, um, I, would, I would steer that questioner to Manta, M-A-N-T-A. -A. Uh, that is the only one that I know of that is uh, great about that. Um, and uh, I think it's uh, an emerging market, so it works. All right, lots of product questions here too. And, um, you know, uh, about, and then how do you uh, ingest and add the um, reporting tools? Uh, and what's your opinion on those becoming the ingestion tools nowadays? Okay, so yeah, I have a fairly strong soapboxy uh, opinion on this, I think, um, which is that um, I, if you've heard the series at all, I, I, I kind of say repeatedly the, to make the data scream out what you should be doing with it. So uh, I mean, let's work on the data layer. Let's put our energies into the leverageable parts of the architecture, which is the data layer and have that data sitting in, um, in the, or you know, created in the data layer uh, that's ready to go. So you can slap any BI tool on top. I don't wanna mean, 
I don't, I don't mean that uh, that's an inconsequential selection there, but truly you can slap any BI tool on top of it and it will get you the information that you need because you've already worked the, the data layer and the data has your calculations. It has your summarizations as needed. It has uh, um, the granular data, level of data, all the components of any calculation and so on right there. So yeah, you wanna do more work in the data layer and uh, definitely data integration you know, you, you want to minimize what, what has to go out to a, a BI tool hub type of thing. I think that's kind of an older architecture approach. Yeah, I would just plus one to that, William, for sure. And, you know, one of the things that I think some people get buyer's remorse for is when they do all of their modeling in the, in the um, BI tool, and then they want to leave that BI tool behind, or they want to reuse that modeling in other contexts, like you mentioned, and, and they realize it's not you know, that work is, is non-transferable if exactly. that happens in the, in the BI layer as opposed to the data layer. Exactly. I love it. Well, thank you both for these great presentations, but I'm afraid that is all the time we have for. And thanks to Matillion for sponsoring today and helping to make all those webinars happen. Uh, just a reminder, again, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. Thanks, everyone. Hope you all have a great day. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Cheers, everyone.